what is the rain in the food desert? That is vegetable oil because all those places, they could not function if we took away vegetable oil. Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert Sean Stevenson, and I'm so grateful for you tuning in with me today. This episode here, I am so pumped about. This is one of my favorite physicians, one of my favorite scientists, and she's got a new project that's really helping to shed some light on a very, very misunderstood topic, and it's the topic of body fat. All right, it's this thing that we tend to see as a very cosmetic. Target. It's a very cosmetic issue for hundreds of millions of people right now. But in truth, our body fat is a major player in so many different dynamic ways as far as our health, as far as our ability to fight infections, viral infections even. And I think that this is going to be incredibly enlightening and something that you're going to walk away with having a better understanding of this incredible tissue that we're all carrying around and what's led to the, 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 the surplus that we're carrying around for many of us and also some more intelligent ways that we can address this and not just for cosmetic issues, but to truly get our society healthier. And I hope that you've been employing different strategies to get yourself healthier right now and also your loved ones. It's more important than ever to reach out, make sure that our friends and family are doing some of the basic necessities of just getting some fresh air, going out and walk, move their bodies, engaging in some stress management practices. And we've done episodes dedicated to all of these things and also making sure that they're getting in some high quality foods as well. It's super important right now. But we just recently went on our first outing since the quarantine began, our first outing to a restaurant we with our friends next door, our next door neighbors. So our families both went and it was very, I felt like I was visiting another planet. I definitely felt a little bit like that scene in Back to the Future when Michael J. Fox goes back to the past and he's got like a hazmat suit on and he winds up in a barn and these folks from like, I think it was like the 1960s happened upon him in his hazmat suit with this DeLorean and the son has this comic book which is like the cover of the economy book kind of shows what the future looks like or these alien invaders look like. So just to get into the restaurant, you walk through the, what the quote lobby is about five feet of lobby and you have to wear a mask to go through the five feet. But then there are people already there sitting at tables. They're socially distanced, of course, you know, one table apart, but they've got, you know, they don't have masks on because you, know, you can't eat with a mask on yet until maybe we get permanent masks installed on our faces in little openings. But the science there just wasn't really accurate, you know, like that five feet. But then once you go past the five feet, you know, you take your mask off and you can eat your, you know, whatever you're there for. But it was a very strange experience because the the waitress had on the hazmat suit. She had on the face shield. She had on the mask. And at that point, I was just like, why be here? You know, like there's so much that goes into it. And it's so abnormal, you know, we should just go ahead and, you know, make dinner ourselves, have a family get together, something like that. It's just an added stressor. It's so much uncertainty. And all the tables had to be labeled that this table has been sanitized and, you know, um, we've hit it with a flamethrower, all these different stuff just to feel comfortable going outside. And it was like that. This was like, a, you know, there's a strip mall and, and everybody is just a very dystopian situation. And this is the situation that we're facing right now. You know, there's a very infectious uh, virus that is that, that we're dealing with as a society. And at its core, we really want to look at, and this is what we've been dedicated to, how do we get our citizens healthier so that we're not as susceptible to this virus and the many viruses that are to come? Because this is right now, this is just the, the first of many that we're going to be faced with as humanity, you know, and the thing that is overlooked and that I've really been working to up level the conversation is as a species, what are the things that make us more susceptible to viral infections? 
what are the things that we can do to help to improve our body's response? Because in truth, we've had such a relationship with viruses throughout human evolution that we are in fact, the human genome is 8%, over 8% endogenous viruses that we are, our, our genome is made of. We've had such an interaction with viruses. We are made of viruses. On that level, we're talking about our human genome, what our genes are made of, the human genes with the things that make us human, we're part virus. And an even more tangible aspect, because I think that's really a hard pill for us to swallow as a, as a society right now, that we are virus ourselves. But, you know, this is something that we can test and track now. We have some affirmation to the fact that we all are carrying upwards of, you know, 300 trillion virus particles in and on our bodies all the time. You know, we are, we're like a playground for viruses and many of them pathogenic, uh, many of them, um, you know, symbiotic, but this whole equation really plays into how healthy are we when we interact with other people's virus load? How healthy are we or what can happen to damage our health and our immune system health that even the pathogenic viruses that we're carrying right now can become you know, opportunistic and take advantage of our system and make us sick. It's a very complex, beautiful thing. And that's an important thing to remember is that this thing is, is dynamic and we understand so little. Your favorite health expert and virologist you might listen to, you know, this is a time where you might not have like Belle Biv DeVoe on your wall or like Katy Perry on your wall. You might have like a virologist, like as your sexy guy. I've been seeing people do posts like, you know, this particular doctor or physician or virologist, this is my hero, and got him on their T-shirt like his new kids on the block. The conversation has changed, but even our most well-educated virologist knows less than 1% about all the viruses that there are. There's so much that we don't know. And the basic fundamental things that we do know, as far as that's concerned, we're not looking at it in the context of a healthy human organism. We're looking at it in the context of sickness. That's the lens through which conventional medicine looks at infectious diseases and chronic illnesses, is through the lens of sick people and not through the lens of what creates health. What does a healthy, sovereign human body look like? How does it run? What does it do when it's exposed to a virus? And that's the first thing that we did in the very first episode that I dedicated to talking about this pandemic. I did a virology 101 masterclass for everybody and talked about how viruses function and also how our immune system works in response to viruses. And if you happen to miss that episode, we'll put it in for you in the show notes. It is mandatory. And so many people have been sending wonderful messages like this is what needs to be heard by every single person because it brings about a certain level of intelligence and education, but also a certain level of empowerment in a world that is very, very scary for, for so many of us. And it's just there's so much to the story that we're not talking about. And we shouldn't be in a debate on who's right and who's wrong. We should be in a discussion of how do we create a, a, a world, an environment that supports the health of every single human being on the planet. And that's just where I'm at. And I hope you feel that way as well. But we can do it. We can move this conversation forward by walking and talking and being the example having the conversation, sharing the data, and also maintaining a sense of awareness that, you know, there's so much more to, to learn and to discover and maintaining that sense of, of openness and curiosity. Uh, even my friends have been texting me pictures as they've been going out. One of my friends sent me a, a, literally he took a picture at his favorite restaurant and is a little bottle of hand sanitizer that comes with, you know, his menu and the hand sanitizer. Let me tell you what it says on the hand sanitizer bottle. It's a picture of a nurse reaching out and shaking somebody's hand, and it says, maybe you touched your genitals, hand sanitizer. What? And he messaged me, he was like, it's true. Well, I mean, you know, they're yours, you know what I mean? So at some point you're going to, never mind. But it's just, it's just, it's a very different world right now. And that's a good thing because all of our questions and concerns, things that have been hiding under the surface, like what we're gonna talk about today, get to be revealed. They get to be exposed and brought to the surface so that we can actually deal with them. And that's why I'm so pumped about this. And on that note, we're gonna be talking about fat today. We're gonna be talking about dietary fats. 
one of the most studied dietary fats right now is medium chain triglycerides. And for good reason, medium chain triglycerides are in a rare category of nutrients that are able to cross the blood brain barrier and actually feed your brain cells, actually deliver nutrition and power to your, in, your brain that's running everything about you. And not only that, medium chain triglycerides also uh, stimulate the body to produce ketones as well, which is this kind of cleaner burning fuel that your brain can use and several other uh, cellular functions in your body as well. And if you look at some data coming out by researchers, and this was published in the annals of the New York Academy of Sciences, and they were looking at whether or not MCTs could have an impact on improving the condition of patients with Alzheimer's. And this is largely regarded as a condition that simply cannot be improved. It can be managed, we can delay the, the, the inevitable decline, but there's not much evidence that we can improve the condition. And what they discovered was that medium chain triglycerides are quickly metabolized by the liver, promoting the production of ketones. The consumption of medium chain triglycerides or MCTs directly led to improved cognitive function in mild to moderate forms of Alzheimer's disease and cognitive impairment. They actually saw improvement in cognitive function. That's not a word that's used when we're talking about Alzheimer's and dementia and cognitive decline. We don't see improvement. We see management of symptoms. We see, uh, let's find a way to slow this thing down, but not an improvement. This should be front page news. This should be something that is very remarkable that we should take note of and, and start to have a broader conversation about because I don't think a lot of us realize that Alzheimer's disease is just skyrocketing. And this isn't a condition where, you know, we tend to think of it as somebody's just losing their, their memories. But this is a very, very, oh man, it's a, it's a difficult situation to watch as a family member begins to degrade. And to the degree that, you know, with Alzheimer's, you don't just forget names. You can forget how to swallow your food. And it's inching its way up into the top 10 causes of death in our country today. But we can do something about it. We know there's tons of evidence. We've done multiple shows on this and had some of the top world's top experts on to talk about delaying and helping to prevent Alzheimer's. But what about when it takes hold? What are some of the things that we can do to help? MCTs are going to continue to play out in the equation as something that's very beneficial. And as I mentioned, it's also been found to cross the blood-brain barrier and be utilized by brain cells. And this is just a great fuel, brain fuel, to have on hand and also a fuel for our metabolism because as you're going to learn today, you know, your body's going to be made out of the fats that you consume. You also want to be cognizant of where you're getting your oils from. So even when we're talking about MCT oils, we don't want to get it from some random, like, you know, company X that might be getting it from an unethical source or even cutting their oils and adding different things that shouldn't really be in there. And I'm a big fan of enjoying the process of getting well and enjoying the process of, of having my nutrition and getting joy out of it as well. So there is the general MCT oil, but also emulsified MCT oil that I have just about every single day. I definitely had it today from on it. All right. It's O N N I T dot com forward slash model. And on it is the number one source for delicious emulsified MCT oils. Again, I have this on a daily basis. Sometimes I'll do the, you know, the classic clear MCT oil, but the emulsified MCT oil easily blends into, you know, hot teas, hot coffees and beverages and things like that. You can add it to smoothies, got delicious flavor as well. And I think everybody should have some of this in their cabinet. And it's just, it's incredible brain food and it's incredible fuel for your metabolism. On it.com forward slash model. That's O N N I T.com forward slash model. You get 10% off all of their incredible MCT oils and everything that they carry there. Their awesome supplements and fitness equipment as well. Just pop over there, check them out. And now let's get to the Apple Podcast Review of the Week. Another five star review titled Thank You for Your Service by I Won't Stop. I appreciate the caliber of this show tremendously. Big thanks to Sean for holding space. In a world of misinformation and bad intentions, I appreciate this podcast greatly for bringing many subjects to the light so that I, along with millions, 
can experience the paradigm shifting, consciousness expanding knowledge that will lead us down the path to our higher selves, mentally and physically. This is the only podcast I can listen to with full intent and not get bored. Much love. Wow, that's such a powerful review. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And I love, you know, the name on the review. I won't stop. I really feel that. That's where I'm at right now. I won't stop, can't stop, won't stop. And thank you, really, truly, truly. That really hit my soul today. And everybody, if you've yet to do so, please pop over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review for the show. It really, really does mean a lot to help to get the information out there, to help to impact the lives of more people. And on that note, let's get to our special guest and topic of the day. Our guest today is Dr. Kate Shanahan, and she's a board certified family physician. And after getting her bachelor's of science in biology from Rutgers University, she trained in biochemistry and genetics at Cornell University's graduate school before attending Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And she practiced in Hawaii for a decade and really studied her patients and studied their culinary habits. And this is where she really began to learn and see some huge discernments in our conventional diet and traditional foods. She applied her learning and experiences in all of these different scientific fields to write her best-selling book, Deep Nutrition, which is definitely a classic. And she also went on to help to create the pro nutrition program for the Los Angeles Lakers, which then was utilized by several other NBA teams and other professional sports as well. And Dr. Kate Shanahan is just a, a real superhero in the, in the space of health experts and physicians. She's somebody who's a real go-to as far as the data that she puts out and reviews and prepares for the rest of the public to be able to consume and to make some sense of all of the the new studies that are being done and just really staying on top of the data. And that's why I just have a ton of respect for her. And I'm just grateful to have her back on the show to talk about her new project. So let's jump into this conversation with Dr. Kate Shanahan. So one of the cool things that I know you were doing and really created a, like a cultural shift in the world of, of professional sports you know, specifically basketball. And you know this, like great information like yours gets out there and it trickles down and people don't know often where it comes from, but you're one of the OGs in this space and you were working with the Lakers. And I believe it was this when Meta World Peace, AKA Ron Artest was with the Lakers. Yeah, a bunch of seasons. Yeah, uh -huh. and so we were just talking about some of the kind of health disparities in different ethnic communities. And I was telling you just about access, you know, me growing up that I just didn't have access. I didn't know that healthy, what the difference was. I didn't know what healthy food meant. I thought bologna was the same as a, you know, grass fed steak. I didn't know the difference or a salad. Um, so you were telling me a story about his mother and he was wanting to get some help for, for his mom. Yeah, he was really worried about her because she was like 150 pounds overweight at the time. And he said, you know, Dr. Kate, do you think you can help her? And I said, of course. So we get on the phone and she's like addicted to, to soda, you know, Southern family, right? So, so many folks just love the sweet drinks in the South. And so we talk about that and she was like, well, I kind of, you know, it's kind of an activity for me almost. So we talked about what else could she do? And and I asked her, did you ever do sports like in high school? Was there anything? She's like, no, no, not real. Well, there was some team sports stuff, you know, that, but, but, you know, nothing she could pick up now. And I said, well, what about like, okay, uh, what about, could you get a trainer? Because it seemed to me that she was just such a social person, mm -hmm. right? Like her son, you know, is extraordinarily um, social and loves all the uh, talking to people about just anything. So, so she did. And, uh, the next time I talked to him, which was a couple months later, she said, oh yeah, she got a train. He says she got a trainer and lost like a hundred pounds. Mm. I mean, it was incredible. The, the power of just making exercise like fun really yeah. for her. Yeah, exactly. Just it, like, that's the great thing about a, a good coach and physician is finding that leverage point. You know what I mean? Like for her is like, she's a social butterfly, much like her son, which I would never suspect. That's that's a joke, guys. You should it, just just Google Meta World Peace and look up one of his interviews. Uh, but, you know, just being able to leverage that and also understanding that exercise doesn't have to be relegated to this little box that we put it into. 
You know, it's just like you go to the gym and, you know, beat yourself up till you're on the ground, you know, kind of that's what you see with marketing. But exercise is movement. Anything you can actually you said this earlier, you said that, you know, just exercise is just, you know, finding something that you enjoy doing is the best form of exercise. Exactly. If what if people ask me like, well, what's the best exercise? And I know it means like that, like they don't like any, anything, right? Like, so what's the best? I just want to know the best one. So I don't waste my time doing anything else. And, and I got my answer from an ad I saw in Hawaii that shows like this little uh, middle-aged lady coming out of a little shack in Hawaii with a surfboard in front, uh, wearing, uh, like a scuba, uh, this outfit, not a scuba outfit, but like a snorkeling outfit on her head. And she's got like an inner tube and she kind of uh, skips over to the mailbox, takes out the mail and then walks back. And they say, um, exercise, uh, just do it. Right. Or just like the best exercise is the exercise you will do. Yeah. Right. That's the bottom line is you, they said you got to start somewhere. Yeah. Yep. I forgot the tag. I just said a minute ago, but yeah, got to start somewhere. And that's so true. And you will, you won't start it if you hate it. Yeah. Um, even if you do start it, you won't do it for long. So it's gotta be fun. And guess what? When you're a fat burner, mm. it is fun. It's a lot more fun. In fact, you won't even realize, you know, once you get into this transition and your metabolism is healthy, you can, you crave it. Your body craves it. Yeah. Uh, you do. You I just got to share this. You blew my mind so many times in this book and just bringing such obvious things that are just under the surface, just bubble up into the, to the degree of like exercise is a matter of energy. Our willingness, our diet is a matter of energy and body fat has such a huge role in this whole equation. So I'd love to start there and talk about that and help paint a picture for everybody. Uh, because basically you shared that the number one determinant of our health is our body fat. And that's not something that we hear. Like we, we just think of body fat as like something we want to get rid of. It's an aesthetic thing. So can you talk about that? Why, why do you say that? And also, can you tell us what is our freaking body fat actually made of? Right. Okay, great. Uh, so our body fat runs our metabolism. Our metabolism is the ability of our cells to generate the energy that they need. And our body fat is in charge of that. So, you know, when we talk about my metabolism needs to speed up or slow down, that actually doesn't really happen at all. When your metabolism is healthy, it's not that it's faster. Um, and it's not, and it doesn't actually slow down. What really happens is that the systems in your body that convert body fat into cellular energy are healthy versus unhealthy. So if they're healthy, they produce abundant energy extremely efficiently and it changes the way you feel. It changes your life on a, you know, minute to minute basis. And when it's unhealthy, your when your body fat is unhealthy, your metabolism is unhealthy and it's inefficient and it cannot convert your body fat itself into cellular energy for your for to run every organ in your body and so what has to happen is your body systems start to rely more on an alternative fuel because when your body fat's not doing its job it's not convertible into energy then your body needs this backup fuel and that is sugar and when I went to school I had like this schizophrenic education around sugar and 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 fat like it didn't quite add up. You know, they were saying, well, your cells really need sugar. Sugar's the best fuel for athletes, for example. Your brain runs on sugar. P.S. body fat. Okay. Well, body, why do we have it? It's, you know, why, why do we have it? Well, we store extra calories. Yeah, okay, but not really. We have it because it's supposed to fuel our cells. And that, like, realization, which came much later after medical school, was – revolutionary for me. I was like, no, wait a second. I've been overlooking the fact that this stuff that everybody wants to burn off is, it, it's actually, it's actually supposed to, that's what it's supposed to be doing. It's not like supposed to be, you follow a special diet to burn your body fat. That's supposed to be, that's the way nature designed it, the, to be the number one thing. And so what is it? It's made out of fat. It's, it's fat. What is fat? So fat is 
a great efficient storage form of energy. So we can just talk just really short like chemistry. It's 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 basically just a, a bunch of carbons that are easily burned by your cells. So like when you fuel up your car, um, gasoline, believe it or not, octane is a kind of fat. Mm. It's a fatty acid, mm -hmm. right? So um, it, there's different fatty acids and, and um, for the purposes of this show, the main thing is there's stable uh, fatty acids and unstable ones. And the seed oils and the things that I say are unhealthy are unstable and they destabilize in our body fat, making it inflammatory. And because of that uh, destabilization process, it also means that our cells can't generate energy efficiently from it. So that means if we've been eating seed oils, our body fat, our body fat is not capable of producing energy the way it's supposed to. And that's what forces uh, our cells to look for that alternative fuel in the form of sugar. But it doesn't it's, it, that's not what they're designed to run on. And there's so many reasons that sugar is an inferior fuel, but that's not what doctors learn. And it's not what dietitians learn. Yeah. And, um, for athletes, it's definitely not what the, the sports dietitians learns. Cause like sports nutrition is almost the, I, ha I hate to say it, but the best word really is corrupted. The science is corrupted by, um, you know, Gatorade and people who want to sell their sports supplement products to give you that boost, supposed boost of energy in the form of sugar, but it doesn't work that way. And that's like, all of that is, I just kind of like said a whole bunch of stuff that really should explode a lot of myths, yeah. but, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's best to, I have to, that's why I wrote the book is to, to break it down, you know, yeah. and to break down each one of these things one at a time, because each one is something that people grow up hearing mm -hmm. which you did incredibly well by the way and I, I the one of the biggest takeaways right there is the fact that we're not looking for a faster or a slower metabolism we're looking for an efficient metabolism and that's really the hallmark of health is that efficiency in our metabolism our body fat is it's an it's an organ in and of itself and what I would want to touch on and make sure that we don't overlook is that Historically, as we evolved, you know, we'll just say even in the last, you know, 10,000, 20,000 years, not even that long ago, the content of our body fat is very different from the content of our body fat today that makes it so inefficient. So you mentioned seed oils, which are these are fats. So our fat is going to be, I guess, a mirror of the fats that we're consuming. Is that a good analogy? So what's different about our body fat today? Um, what's different is that for the past 70 years, we have been unknowingly eating more and more oils that come from seeds instead of oils that come from, um, animals, which is what people had evolved basically eating. Right. So like normally the, the fats that we got just came from stuff that we would animals, we would raise or hunt. Um, whole foods, they, occasionally there would be seeds. Um, if we lived in a tropical climate, there would be, uh, you know, the, the, um, avocados and the, the fatty fruits, but for the most part, it was whole foods and animals. And, and now for the past 70 years, we've been having more and more highly refined seed oils and this, the chemical nature of them is just radically different. And that's where you get into the saturated versus unsaturated. And the, the whole reason we're doing this, we've made this swap of these saturated fats. Uh, I'm sorry, the polyunsaturated fats that are less stable and that promote inflammation. It came from this idea that, um, saturated fat is bad because it clogs our arteries, which was a wrongheaded idea. And it didn't come for good reason. It came from a need for the American Heart Association to get funding from Procter and Gamble that sold cottonseed oil. So it, it came from a lie, in other words. And, and this is like the, I like to say that nutrition science has been in the fake news business pretty much longer than anybody else because this started in the 1940s. 
and um, and and ever since it's been more and more um, that they've with that we've produced these seed oils and we've been eating more and more of them ever since. And it, and it's and at the same time as this has been happening, they've been telling us we need to eat less saturated fat, which we have been. And they've been telling us we need to eat more polyunsaturated fat, which we have been as we've been getting sicker. So it's, it's, it's as if the, the, the people that are giving this message are, they're just stuck. They're just stuck on the message. They can't do anything but repeat the message. Even though, even though all the evidence about our health and what we've been eating suggests a powerful correlation between the more of these things we eat, the sicker we get, but, but they're ignoring it and they just keep spreading the lies. That's bananas. I'm, I'm really sick of things getting politicized, you know, like food should be food, you know, but it's, it's often a political football and underneath everything, like the nutrition program at my college, it was like, uh, I think it was uh, General Mills had some funding involvement, you know, so why would they not promote directly through that medium for us to, you know, recommend? Because that's what we were taught, seven to 11 servings of grains, whole, healthy whole grains each day. And I, I love the fact that you brought up through our evolution, we simply, even the, the ability to get the amount of oil out of a, out of corn, out of, out of a soybean, you know, the massive, um, mechanical uh, uh, innovation that has to take place to do that. We simply didn't have that in our diet, you know, versus like olive oil potentially, but also animal fats. That's primarily what people get in their fats through our evolution. And so this is a new human experiment basically that we're under. And it's turning out, if you look at the direct, you know, kind of causality that you're highlighting in the book, it's not just a correlation, it's a causation. So can you talk about, so is there a percentage increase in our fat makeup in our body fat makeup that's happened? Yes. So they, you, what you can do to find out what's in your body fat is it's, it's really simple. You stick a needle in it and you suck out a little bit of fat and then you send it to a lab and analyze it. And they, they did that about a hundred years ago and they found that the portion of fats that are in this unstable category called polyunsaturated, or I'll just call them PUFAs, uh, was somewhere between two and four percent, and throughout the century, when they checked in again, it kept on increasing, and now it's somewhere between fifteen and thirty percent in the average person, and it's going to depend on your diet. Yeah, fifteen to thirty percent. So, I mean, that's ten times at what people used to have, and it, I mean, it's changing the nature of our body fat and. It's, it's like, think of any, any uh, recipe, you know, for making anything. If you put 10 times of one ingredient in there, what this recipe calls for, it's a radically different thing in the end than what you are trying to make. And that's what's happened to our body fat. It's radically different now. It's supposed to be our friend. It's supposed to help regulate our, our uh, body composition. It's supposed to be like a complete system that takes care of itself. Uh, run by, between our body fat and uh, this communication line between our body fat. Our body fat creates hormones and it sends them to a, our brain and the brain receives the hormones in the appetite center. And the appetite regulation center says, oh gosh, there's so much energy here. Um, let's give this person some uh, adrenaline. So it shoots a message sent down this nerve that goes from your brain to your gut and uh, your heart and um, a whole bunch of other organs that regulate how much energy you feel, how just how energetic you feel. And it's called the sympathetic nervous system. And so your, your body fat talks to your sympathetic nervous system. And the more healthy fat that you have, the more your sympathetic which is your get up and go nervous system is activated. So you're supposed to feel like a ball of energy, but instead when people have overeaten for a couple of days, they feel horrible, right? Like how do you feel after you go on a trip and you just eat out the whole time or go on a cruise and you know, you just eat the deep fried or whatever. 
people come back and, and they tell me, oh my God, I just, I felt terrible. And I know it's because of what I ate, but they don't know specifically that it's these oils, these polyunsaturated fatty acids that um, did not used to be part of the food chain. So they don't have to be, and you can get them out of your diet and out of your body fat. And that's when your life will change. That just blew my mind. So we went from around 1900 to about, it was about 2% of our body fat makeup was these PUFAs to today could be upwards of 30% of our body fat is made of PUFAs. And you just gave, gave such a great analogy of it being like a recipe. When you add that much of one ingredient, it becomes a totally different thing. It's a different recipe. We've become a totally different thing. We're not even the same humans that we were before. We're something else. And that is just alarming to me. So, and guess what we are? We are people who don't want to move, right? That's mm. why we're getting overweight. It's not that we're inherently lazy. This is a, this is a metabolic problem, right? People who are overweight are, are shamed on a daily basis and they feel responsible for their weight because you know they know like oh i don't i just don't feel like i have to get up and go i just there must be something wrong with me but it's not you inherently it's not your genetics it's your metabolism and it boils down to what is that percentage of pufa in your body fat and you don't actually need to know exactly you don't have to go get a biopsy i mean you you, you possibly could if you had a surgeon in a lab but but i in the book the fat burn fix i talk about a couple blood tests that give you some kind of an idea um and how, so how you can gauge it and uh bottom line is you can just ask yourself well how many of these seed oils have, have i been eating do i eat a lot of fast foods do i eat a lot of you know uh, convenience foods? Do I do a lot of snack foods? Because those are the three biggest places where you're the, I call them the hateful eight seed oils, where they're going to get into your body. Mm. The hateful eight. It sounds like a Qu Quinn Tarantino movie. Is that it? Is that a movie? Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know what? Um, I was just thinking about how our being that our body fat is an organ and you mentioned this, how it communicates with our brain and this creates this cascade of communication throughout our entire bodies. And the fact that we can take this organ and we can just uh, haphazardly grow this organ to these crazy uh, amounts that we carry in our bodies. And I know that like, obviously hormones are a big player in this, that we're gonna increase our amount of estrogen that we're carrying around in our bodies. This doesn't just affect our appearance, this affects what's happening with our heart, with our reproductive system, with our digestion, it affects everything about us. And this brings up for me, when I'm thinking about gaining, all, having all of this excess on our frames now as a society, and I just shared this recently on an episode because it's startling. You know, I went and looked at this uh, recent CIA report. It's just like, well, first of all, what do they care about body fat? But they, there's a recent uh, CIA report that disclosed that America is the fattest nation with, with over 40 million people. We are the fattest nation on the planet. And we have, we're getting close to 200 million people in our country that are either overweight or obese. It's, it's 200, we can't even understand how, like a number like that. And so we're talking about this epidemic, a pandemic really, but here in this country of excess body fat and it being made of a specific thing that's excessively dangerous because of what I wanna ask you about next. A big part of this is inflammation. And that word can sound very, ooh, inflammation is coming to get you. It could sound a little hokey, but this is a real, this is a real biological phenomenon that's always happening all the time, but in excess can be increasingly dangerous. So let's talk about what is inflammation and how does this affect and kind of play into this equation with our body fat? So our bodies uh, suffer from inflammation when we are injured or when we have an infection 
And like, so if you sprain your ankle and it swells up, that's an example of inflammation. You uh, get punched in the face and you get a big swollen black eye. That's because of inflammation. And your body's actually doing it on purpose. Even though it hurts, your body's doing it on purpose because there's injury, there's destruction, and your body senses this, and it comes to the area that's been injured and starts breaking it down because just like any uh, good home improvement project, if you got something that is not working right, it's broken, you got to remove it, you got to take it out. So you got to make it actually like worse almost before you can rebuild it back from scratch up again. So that's what inflammation is for. And, um, and it's supposed to occur only when there's an injury or an infection or some other good reason. Um, but what happens when your body fat is loaded with these seed oils is that the inflammation is triggered for no good reason. Like if you're, um, a lot of people have psoriasis, um, or eczema on their skin. That's because the fat right underneath their skin, which is where most of our body fat is stored, is in, is inflammatory, and it's for no good reason. It's just damaging the cells, and it turns red, or it makes um, certain skin cells divide and divide and divide, and that's what psoriasis is. And it's super thick. So, so that's one example of an inflammatory condition that comes directly from the fat beneath your skin, um, and then which is those uh, numbers have just skyrocketed in recent decades as well. Yes. And then this can occur even if you're, so you bring up a good point. It's, it's, is it all about the weight? No, actually it's, it's, it, it's a cause of the weight because of what I said about how it makes us tired. And in the fat burn fix, I talk about how it also makes us hungry, it controls our appetite. It makes us, you know, crave sugar. But it, even if you're a normal weight, if your body fat is still this 30%, 20 or 30%, way too much of these unstable pro-inflammatory fats, your body fat is prone to inflammation and you can have these diseases even with a normal amount of, of body fat. And um, this, I believe, is the number one cause of some serious conditions, autoimmune diseases like uh, celiac disease, like um, lupus and cancers. Um, and it's why actually I was on the Bill Marshall recently talking about, um, you know, the most important thing people can do to protect themselves from the coronavirus is to get these seed oils out of their body. Because when, like, like I said, inflammation is for fighting off infections. So if we have an infection, a viral infection all throughout our body, we are going to have inflammation all throughout our body. So far, so good, right? You cannot fight it. That's a, that's a good thing in normal in a normal world. It would be good. It would help us fight the infection. And we feel sick. We feel like we have a fever. We we don't want to move. Um, but it goes out of control when we've had when we have all these inflammatory fats in our body fat. They they um, they incite the it's like throwing uh, fuel on a fire, and they make the inflammation out of control. And so that's why. When people are dying from the coronavirus, the young people are dying from the coronavirus, it's it's not actually the coronavirus causing the deaths and the, the serious cases. It's the body's own inflammation out of control that can't be reined back in because of the diet. Yeah. And, you know, I, I know you, the, the, the frustrating part of this is that We've been told to eat more of these polyunsaturated fats, right? By the, um, by Harvard, by Tufts, we've been told to eat these things. And so, in in my opinion, it's wildly, wildly irresponsible mm. of you know the the medical leadership, you know the people who are running these institutions of metabolic health to be saying, eat more of this stuff. It's wildly irresponsible. I mean, they've got to know that it's not a good idea. And I think it's, it's business, right? I mean, I, I, you know, it's, you could call it politics. If you don't want to talk politics, then okay, let's talk business. It's good business for the, the canola oil industry and the soy oil industry. And I mean, you know, that's that's why we're hearing what we're hearing about food. And, you know, food is one of possibly the most 
uh, the biggest, it's the biggest business really in the country, I think, but might be tied with health right now yeah. or, it, or poor health. But food is but, the biggest component of our health, you know, as far as something we proactively engage with as well. And I just got to share this because what I'm really hearing, you just really spoke to me because this is not, it's not being talked about anywhere. And I'm just like, I'm so shocked. And I went through a, a, a nice little clip there of being very disappointed and our medical, you know, professionals and also, you know, these, these um, health, quote, health experts who talk about natural medicine and, um, you know, functional medicine, integrative medicine. Where are they? They're not talking. All of a sudden, food doesn't apply here. When one of the things you're really sharing is that COVID-19 really came along and is taking advantage of our severely damaged metabolism. But on top of that, this pre-inflamed condition where we're looking at inflammation is not just about healing. It's also, it's an immune response. And so we're walking around with this chronic low grade to moderate grade inflammation all the time. And we're being set up, we're already set up for when we're exposed to, whether it's COVID-19, COVID-20, whether it's MERS, whether it's influenza, whatever the case might be, we're already pre-subjected to abnormal responses to viruses which we've evolved with having exposure to various novel like novel is the a scary word as well new viruses our our immune system itself evolved from viruses in fact they're made they're based from viruses also facing off against other viruses and us getting better it's a natural normal process but now we're hypersensitive to these things and we're not talking about what is our immune system actually made of it's made of the damn food that we eat your immune cells are made of what you eat, you know, your body fat, which is carrying all of this stuff and this inflammation and, and managing your metabolism and having a huge influence on your immune system. We're making it out of garbage stuff that we've, we did not evolve eating. Like we're a different creature. That's why this virus is taking advantage of us. And that's what I'm really hearing. We, right. We have no chance of fighting off this virus as efficiently as we would if we just didn't have these seed oils in our body and we had, you know, like a full on healthy traditional kind of diet, right? You can, I, so I did a Twitter post the other day about the soy oil consumption in, uh, uh, versus uh, per, per country. So soy oil, soy oil consumption per country, the countries with the most soy oil and the countries with the worst COVID. And it was, you know, it was just a very blunt tool of a way to look at this association, but it was like pretty tight correlations like it uh, in south america brazil consumes the most soy oil in south america brazil has the most coronavirus so stuff like that mm. pops up and and then what you do and this is interesting because they, at the beginning of this thing i remember they were talking about why is it that uh, you know african americans seem to have such a worse time with coronavirus and they did all these like scary statistics, you know, like in uh, uh, Chicago, I think the the folks who were hospitalized were 70% African American and of uh, like the whole rate of infection uh there was something or like the population, I mean it wasn't it's not not Saf they're still a minority, I think. Anyway, they they were the minority. So it was like double, right? It was like the, double the hospitalization rates and double the deaths and everything was double. Everywhere they look at it, um, it's like doubly worse to be African American. And so they were talking about, oh, well, gosh, maybe it's their genetics. Um, mm. But what's going on in actual Africa where, you know, there is so little coronavirus that there was like there were no cases for the first few months. And, and now I, I just looked at it uh, as of June 30th. Like the case rates, there's all these different shades. So there's zero is white and like the lightest shade of pink is is what most of Africa is. And then like a super dark pink is what um, uh, like one country is. Um, but it, so Africa, like most of the countries in Africa have a case rate is something like point one point three per thousand people. So way less than a percent. Um, and, uh, and then in, in this country, it's like 10 times as much. Right. And of course it's more concentrated in the African-American population in this country. And then I looked at what are the oils that these folks are eating and how much seed oil, how much soy oil, cause that's the most easy you can find that it's the most commonly consumed and you can find the statistics, the most easy on soy oil. So I looked into soy oil and there's so little soy oil. 
um, in uh, Kenya. Like I looked only at five countries. I just picked five at random. So Kenya, like none. It doesn't even make the list of the top 70. I have it written down here. Sudan and Chad, none. Um, no, it doesn't make the list, right? So so maybe there's none. Uh, but uh, Tanzania and Ethiopia had some. So between the two, it was like four and 32. Uh, if you look at the, the, the consumption of corn, I'm sorry, soy and canola in, in this country, it's somewhere close to 13,000. And these numbers are in like million, thousands of metric tons. So you got to put a bunch of zeros after these numbers. But but per capita, like the consumption is in the United States of these oils is about 39 pounds per year. And in uh, like the worst, highest consuming country in Africa that I looked up was Ethiopia. Um, and that was 0.27 pounds per year. So we're comparing 39 pounds per year to 0.27. Mm. And coronavirus cases are like less than one tenth. The uh, this is the deaths. I'm sorry, this is the deaths. So it's not just the cases; it's the deaths. So there's nothing inherent about um, the genetics. Yeah. It's the diet. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know. And shout out to Kenya first of all. Uh, my wife's uh, home country, Sasa, everyone, Habari. Um, but just like just if you just go these these things, unfortunately, they seem very complex, but it's very simple things to do if we're asking the right questions. And that's one of the things I really love about you is that you ask these questions and you 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 find well thought out, rational answers to them. You know, these things just make sense. Like what are our bodies actually made of? What's mounting the response? What's causing a hypersensitivity? And then if you look at what's happening here, which I'm very passionate about as well, is you know seeing this uh, increased uh, mortality rate, specifically in the African American community, which is, I grew up not knowing, not having any idea that the food that I was eating made a difference. Like I didn't even make a connection that this food versus this food is any better, you know? And obviously, pr processed food is one of the uh, most accessible things. You know, when I lived in Ferguson prior to, you know, when, like when I was in college and when I was living in Ferguson, Missouri, if I go outside my apartment complex, there is, there's, a, uh, let's see, Lee's Chicken, like I'm just talking about literally within a two block radius, Lee's Chicken, Papa John's, uh, Chinese, three Chinese food places, Domino's, um, there's a Popeye's, there's a little mom and pop's fish place. There is a Jack in the Box, Krispy Kremes, an another Chinese restaurant. I'm just going through it in my mind. Um, three liquor stores, a few check cashing places. Um, let's see, what else? And I'm missing something here. Oh, Burger King. Um, uh, did I say Jack in the Box? Jack in the Box needs to get said twice. All right. Oh, my God. You know, shout out, but shout out to the two for 99 tacos. Oh my God. Um, but you know, it's just literally all of this processed food around me. Whole foods? No. Health food store? Absolutely not. You got to be kidding so me. That, they call that a food desert, right? Yes. There you go. Yeah. But the food, what's in the food desert? What is the rain in the food desert? That is vegetable oil because all those places, they could not function if we took away vegetable oil. Right. And you go into if they if there were like a mini mart, I didn't hear you say like a mini mart or stop and go. But if there were one, most of the food in that store is going to be made with one of the vegetable oils. So it's just the, the food desert, the food that um, it's it's like they don't care, you know, and, and I know that they don't. I, I don't know if I shared this story with you, but when I was in um, Napa, uh, you know, my husband, and I used to live in Napa, California. And we wrote a little uh, uh, article for the local paper called The Stock Report. And one time we wrote an article about the canola blob because we were so upset about having to sit down and pay for a meal, 100 bucks, and there was literally nothing on the menu that was that didn't have canola oil. And so we wrote this uh, and we said, you know, this stuff is really dis – it's disappointing that in Napa Valley restaurants are still cooking with this stuff because it's dirt cheap. Why not just use a better quality oil and stop poisoning us? And so uh, a couple of days later, I got an urgent fax in my office 
from the president of the CIA and in in Napa CIA is Culinary Institute of America, okay. right? So <laughs> I don't have to worry about like looking out the windows and for the snipers, but not yet anyway. But um, uh, so he's so he was saying, you know, I was unnecessarily scaring people because canola oil's very healthy. And so we had a little phone call. I talked to him and he said, why don't you come over and we can break bread and see if we can, you know, come to understanding of our differences. Right. Cause he was in charge of the CIA and he used to run Disney. So he, you know, has a lot of knowledge about chemistry. You know, he sh he's going to be schooling me mm. about uh, chemistry. Right. Thank you. Um, cause I, you know, I, I, my background is in biochemistry. I went to Cornell for, uh, to study it. And, um, so we sat down and one of the things that I will never forget is he started our, our, uh, lunch with a flight of olive oil and how he was describing all the different, um, uh, there's an olive oil tasting, right? So super fancy elite. Um, and so we had all these different olive oils and he said, you know, well, what we do is we put like nitrogen gas on the top of the bottle. So this thing doesn't oxidize. And, and I said, wow, you are so knowledgeable. You are more knowledgeable about chemistry than I thought, hmm. but okay. So if it applies to olive oil, why doesn't it apply to canola again? Cause that can oxidize too. And it can oxidize even qu more quickly than olive oil. And I saw his gears turning for a half a beat. And then without batting an eyelash, he says, we don't have enough olive oil to feed the masses. Mm. Right. So it's yeah. so so I was <laughs> like, I wish I had that on tape because you just said it's OK to lie to people yeah. because we don't have because you think we don't have enough, you know, of the good stuff to feed people. So we got to lie to them. Yeah. And, I mean, there you go. That's the problem. And these are the same people who are the leadership of places like Harvard. He came from Disney. He could have just as easily gone to Harvard because it's all about business. It's not about education. He didn't go from Disney to the Culinary Institute because he was a good chef. He went because he was good at business. So the people that run these businesses are they're the same people and they think the same way. And the reason Harvard and Tufts and Yale, they come out and they say, we got to have more polyunsaturated oils, more seed oils, they call them, or plant oils. Now they give them all different names just so they confuse us as much as possible. That's part of the, what they're doing. Um, it's, it's not for your health folks. So if, if you want to look to an authority, if, if they are also a big business, you should look away because they're they're looking out for their business. They're not looking out for your whatever it is, your health or the tastiest meal, right? These folks at the Culinary Institute of America paying $60,000 each to learn how to cook. Well, they're not learning traditional cooking anymore. They're they're learning how to make, you know, fast restaurant food that looks good and that they can, you know, charge more for because it piles up nicely on a plate. But I mean, so it's it's the business, the business. So we have to, if we want to be healthy, we have to forget about the authority figure and try to tap into our own common sense. Mm -hmm. And if you've got somebody in your family who loves cooking, um, who grew up cooking. What we talk about in our book, Deep Nutrition, is that chefs were the original nutritionists and people who love to feed other people have their hearts in the right place. And they're going to be, you talked about asking the right questions. People who love to cook and feed people, they tend to ask the right questions. Because when it comes to, say, a cut of meat, they're going to be like, okay, well, I want to get the best cut of meat for my family because I want it to taste good and I want it to nourish them. So what that meant a hundred years ago was what did this animal eat? Where did it, where did it, you know, grow up? Where did the animal grow up? Those kinds of questions, which with the fancy words for it, what is the source, right? What's the source? Was it a grass fed farm or was it a, a industrial farm? They, they, the business people, they do not want us having these conversations. They do not want us asking these questions because once we start looking, we don't want to buy their products. Yeah. So powerful. So powerful. And you know, it's so funny to, to you get you you actually had a direct conversation and experience like that to see that this wasn't about health. You know, this was a business choice. And I just mentioned this recently. I, I did an episode dedicated to why America was hit so hard by the coronavirus. 
And just looking at very simple things that anybody can look into is that, you know, the United States has delivered billions of dollars in government subsidies for these kind of, you know, monocrop, you know, wheat and corn and soy used for things like high fructose corn syrup, used for, you know, creating these, quote, vegetable oils and seed oils. And there was a study that found that the, they looked directly at the people that are eating the most of these government subsidized foods and seeing like over 30 percent increase, maybe it was 40 percent uh, in obesity, like tied directly to it. I think it was 37 percent. But I will put that episode for you guys in the show notes. So there's been studies done to look at what's the what's the connection between this action and this action. And I forgot one in my food desert neighborhood, McDonald's. There was a couple of McDonald's and they were cooking, of course, in, you know, some kind of monstrosity vegetable oil. But in other countries, it might be, you know, a tallow or something like that. And I think it even used to be beef tallow. But the game has changed, has mutated. And if you could actually, I want to. I want to talk about the Ninja Turtles. I want to talk about um, specifically a, a certain type of vegetable oil and a process. And most importantly, I want to talk about what are some, some solutions? You know, the fat burn fix. How can we change uh, the construct of our fat cells? And we're going to do that right after this quick break. So sit tight. We'll be right back. Growing up, if I thought about chocolate, I think about Three Musketeers. I think about a Kit Kat, Butterfinger, right? I had all these ideas, hot chocolate, uh, chocolate ice cream, chocolate cake. Those are the things that would conjure up in my mind when I thought about chocolate. Little did I know that chocolate itself, the original root of chocolate, which comes from something that's botanically a, a seed, these cacao seeds was one of the most healthy foods in the world. Listen to this. This was from a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition found that polyphenol-rich cacao or cocoa without the sugar has remarkable prebiotic effects on the human body. So what the study found was that folks who were consuming this sugar-free cacao flavanol drink for four weeks significantly increased their ratio of probiotics or friendly bacteria bifidobacteria, for example, while significantly decreasing their class of firmicutes, which is associated with fat gain. So there's certain types of bacteria that are associated with gaining fat. And these firmicutes, so the saying in health right now is that if you want to be firm and cute, you got to reduce the firmicutes. All right. I didn't make that up. Somebody else did. All right. But the bottom line is, wow, it has a really powerful, remarkable impact on what's happening with your microbiome. The study also found that it was able to reduce levels of systemic inflammation measured by something called C-reactive protein. And if that weren't enough, cacao also has these compounds that have a really powerful influence on our mood, like anandamide, which is known, like that translates to mean bliss chemical, right? Uh, serotonin, tryptophan, these precursors that help your body to produce things like melatonin, right? That helps you to sleep better. It goes on and on and on, but the quality matters a lot. And when you get real chocolate into something that is even more health giving, you've got something really special. And that's what they have with the new chocolate Organifi Gold Drink. So they've got the chocolate along with their incredible, delicious turmeric formula. And as you know, turmeric has very powerful anti-inflammatory properties. And it also has been clinically proven to have anti-angiogenesis properties. So this means that turmeric literally has the ability to cut off the blood supply to cancer cells, all right? And we all produce cancer cells every day, but a pro properly functioning immune system and being able to regulate this angiogenesis, which we need, but we need at certain levels, is incredibly important. And food can help to regulate that. So I'm a huge fan of Organifi. Now they've got the new chocolate gold. All right, so pop over there, check it out. Just release, just delicious. Organifi.com forward slash model. You get 20% off that and everything else they carry. All right, so head over there, check them out. Organifi.com forward slash model. Model, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com forward slash model for 20% off. Now back to the show. All right, we're back and we're talking with Dr. Kate Shanahan. So your book, did it hit the New York Times? It did. Yeah. I was so thrilled. Yeah, I was so thrilled. I was like, wow, okay, that made my year. <laughs> yes, congratulations. It is such an epic book and it's well-deserved. And I'm just so grateful for you putting the time and energy. I know what it takes to create something like this, and this is just remarkable. 
but one of the things you also talked about in the book is that our body fat actually controls our temperament, right? Our body fat controls our temperament. We talked about like the kind of get up and go gusto energy to be able to work out, just to, to even have the energy to make our own meals. Um, but also there's some kind of psychological um, com components to it that this can affect. Can you talk about that a little bit? So what happens when your body fat is unhealthy because of the seed oils is, is that I mentioned your, your cells use more sugar. And what that does to our appetite is so important to understand. Um, it's like everybody knows sugar's not healthy, right? And, and they talk about, well, I'd, I'd love to get off sugar, but I'm addicted to it. And sugar is, we talk about sugar as being addicting, but there's two kinds of addiction. And I want everyone to understand the two different kinds. And the, so the, the one kind is the kind that we've heard about more that, that the sweetness gives you this like, oh my God, like you roll your eyes back. Like this is the best experience ever. Just give me more. I want to sit here and just eat M&Ms until the whole bag is gone. That was me. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then there's this other kind of addiction was ha which has to do with brain energy and the fact that your brain depends on sugar for energy when your body fat can't give it the energy it needs, right? So that's a metabolic addiction. And the the hedonistic or the, the the enjoyment addiction, they call it hedonistic addiction, pleasure. That you can't you have no hope of getting over that while you have a metabolic addiction, while your brain needs sugar or it thinks it does, right? Your brain is smart and it learns to associate um the relief of energy deficits with sweetness or carbohydrate, starchy food. So that's where these cravings come from that are truly, you would have to be like a uh, Mr. World Atlas of willpower to resist a metabolic, metabolically driven sugar craving for long enough to actually lose weight, right? You could do it for a day, two days, maybe a 21 day challenge. But if you're still metabolically addicted, it's going to come back. It's not going to go away the way they promise. And, and that's because your brain doesn't know that there's energy in your body fat. It can't read the signals. The, the inflammation is, um, is getting in the way of the signals, the hormones that your body fat's trying to send to your brain. It's not, they're not being received. And so your brain is like, I just, I got to have me some more sugar. I got to have more sugar. And so you're, the part that that translates to, how does that make you feel? Well, there's this word that didn't exist when I was growing up, hangry, mm -hmm. but everybody talks about it now. Like I'm hangry. I got to get me a snack or something. Well, that's a sign of a metabolic problem. That is a result of this obesity epidemic, that term. And we laugh it off because we don't understand how serious it is. But it's if you're hangry, if you can't concentrate because it's an hour past your lunchtime, or if you're irritable or you don't want to talk to somebody because, oh my God, it's that person and I just, I can't do this without a snack, right? Um, that's not you. That's that's your brain needing more energy. That's your brain having a, a dysfunction because it needs more energy. And when your brain doesn't get the energy that it needs for six seconds, the cells start to die. They start to seriously dysfunction and they can't transmit the electricity. So if you've ever had like a moment where you were having trouble concentrating at work or, uh, um, you know, you just, you get, you, you get somewhere and you feel overwhelmed by the, the experience and you feel like, Oh my God, I, maybe it's anxiety. Maybe I have an anxiety disorder. My guess is those occur because this is what my patients tell me when I tease it out. When you're on the hungry side, when you, you are, it's, you're late for lunch or you didn't have as big of a breakfast as usual or something, your brain is not getting energy. You can't process this information, this complex information. Um, and that makes you anxious when that happens that, you know, what is the, what is like the most anxiety provoking situation? It's like a new day at work or something like that, right? Because there's new people, there's new tasks that is naturally anxiety promotion promoting it's normal to be anxious and what the reason 
we have that stress feeling is because there's so much to learn and we don't understand. We can't make sense of so many things. But that happens to you every couple hours if your metabolism is damaged enough where you can't get your energy from your body fat and you just you can't keep your blood sugar levels high either. That's that happens when you're on the path to diabetes and we call we call it prediabetes as another word for it, insulin resistance. Um, or if you do have type two diabetes, I'm only talking about type two, not type one here. Um, it's, it's worse, right? Like, so people who are type two diabetic have gotten it, uh, gotten into their diabetes because not, they, not because they lack willpower, but because their brain keeps telling them, I need more energy and you, you got to obey it when I mean, your brain is in charge of you. So if there's food there and your brain's saying, I'm sorry, I can't function, you're going to go and get the food, even if it's not healthy and you know it. Mm. So and this is really great summation, you know, what you talked about in the book is that, and it's so simple that our bodies and our brains should be capable of missing a meal and not freaking out and going into red alert. You know, like our, we have, we carry energy. That's what body fat is for. Its purpose is to carry energy. But most of us are not able to tap into it because our fat cells are literally so gummed up with these abnormal fats. And if you could, can you actually share with us, like, obviously I mentioned it's a major mechanical process that simply just wasn't around thousands of years ago. How do we get a seed oil? Like, how do you get like a canola? How do you get a rapeseed oil? How do you get like, um, you know, a corn to be able to, to create oil or, you know, any of these crazy, what we call these vegetable oils, but they're not freaking kale oil. <laughs> how are they made? In a factory. So, uh, nature does not make bad fats. So if you're eating a whole food or, you know, anything that looks like food that has flavor, it's not a bad fat, but if it has, if it's in a bottle, it's clear, you don't know what it tastes like. It has no odor. It probably came from a factory and what they do in the factory, it's at least 40 steps, 40 different types of machines. Um, and they, the, the first thing that they do is they, you know, they pour a whole bunch of the seed into a giant container and they usually they heat it, they put pressure in there and they get some kind of a solvent like hexane, which is, you know, in gasoline as well. Um, and they try to dissolve out the, uh, the lipid, the fat from the seed. So they separate the, the fat from the protein and the starch and all the other stuff. And that creates a big, ugly, sludgy, disgusting, foamy, waxy mess. Um, but what I just said is like multiple different machines. So they pump these, they pump the oil in one direction, and then the solid parts, they're not done with that. There's there's still something that they're gonna do with this disgusting pile. It's just it looks like you know poop. It just like plops over the edge of stuff and it sits there in an ugly heap. They use that for animal feed. Or, or they might use it to, you know, uh, to make carpet backing or they use it for industrial purposes, but they do feed it to animals. Um, and, uh, and so then they've got this foamy, waxy, uh, crude oil and it has to be refined. And that's where the, that's where a lot of damage occurs because these are very unstable fats. They've already been put through one process that strips out that, that, that separation I just described, it destroys any kind of vitamins that were in the seed. So, uh, you know, vitamin E, which is a uh, highly um, fat soluble vitamin that we need and the seeds need to keep those, those PUFAs stable, it destroys the vitamin E. It takes out a lot of minerals. It's so, uh, so that it's not just um, that these oils are unstable, they've also been just stripped of nutrition. And then they have to be um, refined, bleached, and deodorized. And so that's where a lot more of the damage to the, to the PUFAs occurs. And you actually get toxins that are sitting in the bottle by the time it leaves the factory because the unstable fats have broken down and they degrade into unnatural molecules that didn't, don't exist in nature and our bodies can't use and they have very toxic effects. But it, what does it look like? So just to paint a picture, we're talking about a huge warehouse with giant steel containers and lots of piping. And this is the same technology. If you've ever driven by a, like a motor oil refinery, you know, a 
where they make gasoline. There's usually a kind of a stinky smell. It's the same technology. They're, they're refining the oil. They're fractionating out the different components of stuff that were in the seed. That doesn't sound good at all. This does not sound normal. This is not normal, people. And it's in everything. You know, it is so crazy. I, I remember even in the context when I was talking about, the, you know, the food desert that I grew up in or that, you know, that um, I lived around much of my life. Even when we go to Whole Foods right now, as of this recording, and well, they don't have this right now because as of this recording, the hot bars are not, uh, they're not out there because the hot bars are the scary thing. Um, but even at the hot bars, if you look at the ingredients, 99% of the hot meals that Whole Foods has, it's canola oil is in the ingredients. You know, it's just like it's except it's been so imbued into the culture that this is healthy because it's given its name vegetable oil or seed oil. Seeds are good. But when you understand what it's actually made of, what it takes to create something like that. And the fact that it's in so many different things that we consume and the fact that your fat cells are going to eat, basically, the fats that you give it, we start to paint a much clearer picture of why we're so unhealthy right now, why we're so susceptible to disease, why we're so much more susceptible to uh, contagion and viral infection. And I'm just so grateful for, for, for this communication and, and you doing this work to make it all make sense for us. Uh, so if we can, in, in closing, I want to talk a little bit about what can we do? Like, what are some of the solutions? Because I would imagine getting those low quality fats out of our body isn't necessarily something that is is going to be like a, a, a graceful process necessarily. Like what can you just give me give us some insight on what we can do to help to shift that ratio in our bodies? Yeah, when, the day that you start eating them and you start getting healthier fats in your body, you're going to notice more energy and you start solving the problem that day. The day that you decide that you're going to start looking for how have these things been getting into your body, that day is a day that you start healing. And you will experience benefits in the first days or weeks and months. Um, and it will be a continual ongoing thing that it, it may take like a full like year and a half before you really get to the point where you're like, wow, this is what I've been missing. You know, people notice, they tell me they have more energy starting right away, but you get to like a, another level. Uh, you know, I used to be that person where after a hard day at work, I would come home and my head would be full of like, oh, oh my God, other people's problems and trying to figure things out and not say the wrong thing at the wrong time and make them hate their doctor. And, you know, I don't, I never wanted to hear my doctor told me I never wanted to hear that, you know? <laughs> um, but, and I couldn't, so Luke would be like, how was your day? And I'd be like, I don't want to talk about it. Let's just watch <laughs> Mad Men or what, you know, just feed me dinner, you know, help. And, and, and I didn't have the mental energy to process my day and share mm. it, you know? So I was less of a wife, really. And now I'm probably still not the best wife. I, don't, I haven't gotten the best wife award yet or the best wife uh, cup from <laughs> <laughs> that Trump one. <laughs> You're the best wife ever. Um, but I haven't gotten that yet. But uh, but but I, you know, I, I can come home from a full day and I can tell a story, you know, just a little simple thing like that. I, I couldn't do that. And I thought it was me. I thought I was just one of those people that I, I couldn't, you know, tell stories sometimes or, you know, I, I thought I was a lesser person really. And, and it wasn't truly me. It was just, I didn't have the energy. And so that's what, you know, that's what energy, uh, can do for you is <laughs> my husband just, Oh, well, look at this. Oh, uh, that's awesome. She got the award. Oh, guys, I hope you're watching on YouTube. He just delivered the Best Wife Ever award, award in that moment. And the Grammy goes to, oh, uh, that's so awesome. Shout out to Luke. Like to so, my husband. so beautiful. But yeah, I mean, so this is like what's waiting for you is you don't know, right? But maybe all those things that you've wanted are out there for you. And you just want to, that day that you decide, I'm going to start looking, I'm going to memorize the hateful eight. I'm going to start looking for them. And I'm going to go to Dr. Kate's website and find her shopping list of better products and start trying them. 
That's the day. That's all you need to do. You just start, right? You don't have to do it all at once. I didn't do it all at once. And I'm, I'm supposedly the expert. <laughs> uh, you know, I did it one thing at a time. Yeah, we just started eating. We just said, okay, no margarine and just butter. And um, yeah, let's get the full fat dairy and let's eat more eggs. And I sure love sausage. You know, we just went with the low hanging fruit, the stuff we loved. And it, when you do it that way, it's going to feel really easy. Uh, I love it. So, so simple and ap applicable right now more than ever. Just something that we can all literally put our hands on and put in our bodies is swapping out our fats. And you've got so much more information, obviously, in your new book, New York Times bestselling book, The Fat Burn Fix. Can you let everybody know where they can pick up your book and where they can connect with you online? So yeah, connecting online at drkate.com. So it's D-R-C-A-T-E, Kate with a C. And there's no dot after D-R for doctor. Uh, but drkate.com. And I have information about my different books, why you might want to um, you know, pick one over the other and where you can buy them because there's been difficulty keeping it stocked at Amazon. But for the most part, um, you know, it's it's pretty much any bookseller online. And um uh, you can get it even in audiobook. If you're a podcast listener, you probably love listening to books. Get the audiobook and uh, and learn while you drive, while you burn. <laughs> yeah, awesome, uh, Dr. Kate. You're one of my favorite people in this space. You know, you just uh, the 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 amount of intention and energy that goes into something like this is not overlooked. I truly, truly admire and appreciate it because it's a exceptional quality right now. Like there are, there are wonderful physicians out there doing wonderful work. It's a whole other realm to be able to like, look at the evidence, look at, stay on top of the, the, the data coming out. It is like, it's a full-time job in and of itself. And I definitely admire you for that because you're keeping people educated as to what's going on in real time and putting the pieces together. And that's what we have in the Fat Burn Fix. And again, just thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your wisdom with us. It's such a pleasure to talk to you, Sean, because you just break it down into such fun and interesting pieces that really, I know your audience must love you because you touch me when you're talking to me. So <laughs> I'm sure you touch them. Awesome. Th that means so much coming from you. Thank you. Thank you again for hanging out with us today. Thank you. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to this episode. I hope you got a lot of value out of this. Uh, man, again, just make sure to pick up The Fat Burn Fix. It's a, it's a really poignant, important, timely book for what's going on in the world. And the side effect is that we can get our bodies a little bit healthier. We can, you know, obviously the, the term, and she knows this, is going to be some, 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 some pizzazz in there with fat burn because it's one of those words. It's one of those kind of key words that we look for, but she's talking about really fixing our body fat. It's a whole different dynamic and angle to this equation. And it's fascinating. And it's unfortunate that this hasn't really been talked about until now. But the good news is we're alive for it and we are here for it right now. We have access to it. You know, there was a time when getting information, like you had to be like, you had to be in some secret society or something to get the information now. You just literally go to your phone and you can get the data. You know, you can order the book. You have access. There's nothing holding you back from transforming your knowledge base and transforming your life. And a simple takeaway from today is to start swapping our fats. I think there's a show that's like called Wife Swap or something like that. People are swapping wives, swapping families. Swap your fats. So much easier. Why don't we have a fat swap show and just see how our health could transform? You know, so that's what it really starts with is understanding like, it's a major component of what our bodies are made of. And I really don't think there's anything more important than that. You know, our bodies, again, I'm going to continue to say this. We're made of the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food that we eat. That's what you see in the mirror. And that's what this entire conversation about, you know, our immune system and what we're facing right now as far as uh, um, infectious diseases this, there's so many more to come. In truth, we know about less than 1% of all the viruses that there are right now in the world. And the viruses we do know about, we barely know anything about them. Okay, human health and our world is so dynamic and so, 
oh my goodness, it's, it's, it's constantly evolving that we're never going to know. And that's the beauty in it. And it's embracing that not knowing that keeps us curious and asking questions and listening to conversations like this with an open heart and open mind so that we can actually paint a well-meaning picture and carry that with us to create the life and, and the health that we truly desire and deserve. I appreciate you again so much for tuning in today. If you got a lot of value out of this, make sure to share this out with your friends and family on social media. Uh, definitely tag me. I'm at Sean Model. And um, just let me know what you thought about the episode and just keep sharing the information. I see you guys out there and it means so much. We're really working to, to, to up level the conversation and bring it back to a place of rationality, which unfortunately it's kind of far in between right now of what we're seeing in major media. And even, you know, online with some of our favorite health experts have like they're abandoned ship, you know, they, it's like a pirate story to them. They're pirates of the Caribbean. You know, when it really boils down to it, we need them most, but I'm here for it. I'm ready. I'm strong and I'm willing, but I'm strong because of you. You know, you help to really keep me energized and keep me juiced because this is why we're alive right now. We're alive right now at this moment in history to up level humanity. And that's what it's really about. So, again, thank you so much for hanging out with me. I'll talk with you real soon. We've got some epic, epic episodes coming your way. Take care. Have an amazing day. and I'll talk with you soon. A recent report coming out of New York found that 88%, this is the combination of folks who strictly sheltered in place and people who were forced to shelter in place in nursing homes, 88% of the people who had severe infections from COVID-19 were the people who didn't go outside.